You know, with everything being dead around today, I want to inspire you and let you know that God is not dead, family. We serve a living God. The time of lesson today is simply, God's not dead. God is not dead. God is not dead. You know, we live in a time where being faithful and committed is nearly impossible. 25,600 marriages ended in divorce last year in the Netherlands. Marriages are dying. There are over 500,000 single mothers in the Netherlands. Fatherhood is dying. 40 million Americans were college dropouts in 2021. Education is dying. There are approximately 41 million abortions in a year. 200 abortions per day. Motherhood is dying. There are almost 10 million people in prison. Morality is dying. You know, with everything being dead around today, I want to inspire you and let you know that God is not dead, family. We serve a living God. Now you might say, well, Fred, I don't know. I think God is dead. Well, you wouldn't be living and breathing had it not been for God. You know, we, th you know, we, we, we think, you know, the first words you pronounce as, as, as a baby is mama, papa. No, that's not the first words. The very first words you pronounce as a baby is actually God's name, Yahweh. You see, we think, you know, for example, in the English, we've got different vowels, we have different phonetics and so forth. So when we pronounce uh, God's name, which is uh, Y-H-W-H, we say Yahweh to help us in English, but in the Hebrew, it's not Yahweh, it's <sighs> Yahweh. So here is in, uh, out, uh, exhale, and where is inhale. So the very first words you speak is God's name, <laughs> Yahweh. <laughs> you wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for God. God is not dead. In 1882, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche declared, God is dead. Well, he is dead, but God is still alive. And it's kind of crazy because, to some extent, I kind of believe that statement a bit. That God is dead. So like, what do you mean, Frank? Well, we just read the st uh, statistics earlier. Many people are living their lives without God in their lives. And when, and when you live your life as if God is dead, let me tell you, you're going to become a statistic as well. You fall under the same category. You know, I don't believe that God is dead because he gave me arguably the most beautiful wife in the world. Her name is Sinead Similani. I'm grateful for her. You know, she's incredible because she's a, she's a superwoman, you know. She leads the women's ministry, of course, here in the church. Uh, she's been personally fruitful this year already. Uh, she works in an internship. She's studying uh, in, a, in, in school at the same time, trying to get a diploma. She's trying to get you guys going. She's married to me at the same time, looking beautiful and radiant. I'm like, man, what an incredible woman of God I have in my life. I'm grateful for you, baby. I love you. Let's go to Luke 15, family. Luke 15. You guys with me today? You guys like the location we're in today? Pretty awesome location over here. God really did open a door. In Luke 15, we are a Bible church. Bible says in verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had Two sons. Now, of course, this man represents God, and his sons represent disciples in the kingdom of God. Verse 12. The young one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. I mean, man, you know, what this means is that this disciple basically said, God, you are dead to me. Give me my blessing. That's basically what he's saying over here. To ask for the inheritance before the death is literally you're saying, no, Father, you're already dead right now. You might as well give me the inheritance while you're still living. 
That's literally what it means. So a disciple who's, you know, this is equivalent to a disciple saying, God, you are dead in my life. Give my blessing. Now it says over here, verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. I mean, this guy didn't even waste any time. He was quick to leave the kingdom of God. You know, so sad that disciples can be so quick to leave fellowship, but very slow to come in to meet God. I mean, you see disciples leave church so quick. God, bro, where are you going? <laughs> but when it comes to coming to church, man, whoo, we drag our legs. We're like, man, we come in later. I mean, man, you know, guys, we're coming to a new year. Are we not family? Okay, now remember, I, I, you know, I, I, I love the church because we're family. And, and we can be real and honest with each other, guys, okay? Yeah. We're, we're coming to a new year, guys. And we, we cannot enter 2024 where disciples are, are later than some of the guests that come to church. That, that, that's got to go. That's got to be in 2023. That's got to go, family, amen? That's got to go. We serve a living God. That means we got to come, you know, not just on time. We got to come early to church. Ready to worship God. So we see that, you know, it, when, when, when you're in a rush to leave the fellowship, you, you, you're kind of in a way saying, God, you are dead to me. Now look what happens after that. It says, not long after that, the young son got together all he had, set up for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. You know, we see that. One of the signs of someone who says God is dead, man, he wants to be far away from God's family. Far away. Distant country. What are you so far away from God for? Why are you going so far away from disciples, bro? You see that? You see, in the Bible, God works in powerful ways through isolation. God works in isolation. I mean, when you isolate yourself and you have your quiet time and stuff, that's awesome. God speaks to you. But you know who else works in isolation? Satan. Satan works in isolation. See, Satan's compared to a lion. See, a lion, a lion doesn't like to attack the strongest animal in the herd. A lion doesn't like going for the sheep that's like, you know, the strong, the, the leader in a way. Sometimes it does, but the lion likes going for the wandering sheep. The sheep that's alone, super far away. It's like, that's my, that's, that's my prey. And the lion goes after that, 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 that prey over there. See that? So we see, we're seeing some signs here of someone who says God is dead. Now, he, he goes far. He doesn't speak to his dad anymore. That's, that's him not having quiet times anymore. He's like, I don't want to speak to my father anymore. I'm, I'm done praying. I'm done my dad talking to me in, my, in the Bible. I'm, I'm done having quiet times. And, and that's what can happen. Someone who is not having quiet times, man, you, you're basically saying, God, you are dead to me. You're dead to me. You guys with me, right? Look what happened. He gets his inheritance. He goes super far away. And there, he squanders his wealth. He wastes the blessing. You know, people want the blessing without the character. You know why he squandered his wealth? Because he had no character. <laughs> And that's why he squandered his wealth. He was wasteful. You see what I mean, family? Yeah. You know, we, we, we see that nowadays, you know, when it comes to the people who win, like, the lottery. You know, when, when, they, when they win the lottery, you're like, man, they win, like, 50 million euros, the jackpot. You're like, whoa, it's incredible. And then they say that 70% of all lottery winners lose all their wealth in, like, three years. A few years after they win. Because they've got the blessing without the character. And that's what can happen sometimes. We hold God hostage, say, God, give my blessing right now. But God says, no, I love you. You have no character to hand the blessing. God loves you way too much to give you what you, you, you want before the character. Let me tell you something. I praise God every single day of my life. I got married at 27. Every day, I, I praise Jesus. I'm like, thank you, God. 
man, you know, I want to get married at 21. Trust me, I was not, I had no character. I had no spirituality to deal with, you know, this woman of God is, that God has prepared for me. I mean, I'm grateful I waited seven years in the kingdom of God to finally get married. Because I had to have character. I need a character. Now, look at this. Verse 14. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomachs with the paws the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. You know, what people don't understand is that when you try to live your life without God, there's a famine ahead of you that you don't even see. There's a famine. A famine means a lack of something. It's just nothing. And, you know, people think, yeah, you know, I'm leaving God. No, there's a famine waiting for you that you don't even know about or you don't see at all. There's going to be a famine of discipling. There's a famine of love, a famine of true friendships, a famine of family. I mean, it's going to be, you're going to come across a famine sometime. And then it says, he started, he started being around the, the pigs. I mean, you're going to say something. This, this guy was kind of like a Jew. Jews never, they never find themselves around pigs because pigs were considered to be unclean animals. And now, he's far away from God and he's now finding himself doing things he never ever thought he'd end up doing. He's with the pigs. It's like, man, I never saw myself going this far in my life with the pigs. You know, there's one brother, you know, some of you guys may know him. This brother, he, he, he struggled with so much impurity. He didn't want to, conf- he didn't want to like repent from it. Um, he, he, he fell away and he wind up turning gay. That's what happened. He ended up becoming someone he never ever thought he would become when he said, God, you are dead to me. Some of you guys know him here. Came back, we restored him back, back in the church in London, and then he just went back again and again. I was like, man, you have no idea the kind of person you're going to become when you, when you say, God, you are dead to me. You know what keeps me faithful is I know the person I'm going to become without God. I know, I know, I know the person. To some extent, I'm like, man, because I know my sinful nature. I know my sinful nature. So you got to know the person you're going to become. You can become way worse off. We're going to talk about that very soon when you say that God is dead. Now look at this. Check this out. Verse 17. When he came to his senses. That's a census bubble talk over there. He went to bubble talk. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. You know, I like this. It says he came to his senses. Now, of course, the Greek word for come to your senses, it means he came back to himself. He came back to himself. He said, wow. That means when you say God is dead, you become someone else. You become someone else. And when he came back to his senses, he's like, oh my goodness, I've got a living father. My father is actually alive. He's not dead. And he thought God was dead, but he was the one who was actually dead. Because the father says, my son who was dead has now been brought back. So you might think that God is dead, but you're the one who's actually dead. We see over here this young man, sadly, believed that God was dead. But he came back, amen? Now, what are some things that can make you feel like God is dead? Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, what, what are some things that can make you believe that God is dead? First Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith 
and full of deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. You know, one of the reasons why you believe that God is dead is because you're listening to deceiving spirits. You're listening to deceiving spirits. That's why, that's why you believe that God is dead. You know, people say, oh man, um, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is guiding me to make this decision. Okay, bro. Number one, the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. And if this decision you're making is not according to the scriptures, bro, sis, that means that's not the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's a deceiving spirit speaking to you. So you got to be careful there. The Holy Spirit doesn't go against the word of God. They go hand in hand. So if you say the Holy Spirit is leading you and you can't find the scripture to back up what you're saying, you're being led into, that's a deceiving spirit, not the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens over here. People believe God is dead because they follow and believe deceiving spirits. Now it says over here, deceive. Now the word deceive in Greek is planos. It means to cause to wonder or lead astray. So these spirits have a, a purpose. The purpose of these spirits is to cause you to wonder and to be led astray. And you got to ask yourself today, family, what spirit are you listening to? What spirit are you listening to? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit or a deceiving spirit? Sadly, even some evangelists have, have fallen into the trap. In our movement, they, they listen to deceiving spirits. Say, I'm guided by the Spirit to leave the church. Okay, bro, there's a deceiving spirit you're listening to. You see that nowadays. We've had that this year in our churches. Deceiving spirit. Let's go to 2 Peter, guys. Now, what's another reason why? Okay, what, what, what else makes you believe that God is dead? 2 Peter chapter 2, rather. 2 Peter chapter 2. We find another reason why people believe that God is dead. In verse 19, it says, They promised them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were. At the beginning. Another reason why someone believes that God is dead is because they have a love for the world. They have a love for the world. And the love for the world has entangled them and has overcome them, basically. And then they have what's called spiritual amnesia. Okay? What's spiritual amnesia? All of a sudden, you believe that the life you had in the world was actually amazing. And you forget about the abusive relationship you were in. You forget about the depressive nights you had. You forget about, you know, the self-harm you did. You, did, you forget about the, the, the drug addiction you were in, the porn addiction you were enslaved to, and so forth. The insecurity you felt every day. And all of a sudden, you're in the kingdom and the world is more attractive. That's, that's, that can make you believe that God is dead. A love of the world still in your heart. Okay, what else? Let's go, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Stay in the same book over here. You guys with me, right? Yeah. Okay, we're, we're Bible church, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's find out what else makes you believe that God is dead. Look at this in verse, in 2 Peter chapter 1. Say something over here. Well, that's the wrong scripture. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. See, guys, there's different kinds of trials. There's not just one trial, there's a lot of them. Verse 7, these have come so the proven generous of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor, honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls, and the church says, Amen. 
You know, your faith has one goal, get you to heaven. Get you to heaven. Your faith has one goal, to get many other people to heaven as well. See that? It says your faith, the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, God does not want you to have a comfortable life here on earth and you go to hell. God's number one priority is to get you to heaven. Number one priority. To get you to heaven. Number one. And part of that is he's going to put you through some trials on earth. You see that, family? And what can happen is that as God is trying to refine you to make your faith golden. See, you got to say something. Gold, in, we, we buy gold, you know, the golden necklaces and chains and stuff like that. Now, it's not usually like that. It's, it's mined, it's ugly, it's dirty, it's just this ugly lump. And what happens is that the goldsmith has to, in a way, put into this, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, cauldron of, of, of golden oil and just bo- boil it like crazy. Heat it up. And what happens is as he heats it up, the dross and the impurities come to the top. And as the impurities come to the top, he has to remove the impurities and the, the goldsmith has to see his reflection inside the gold. So God says, I got to see my reflection in your faith. And if I don't see my reflection, he is still dead. So when he puts you through those trials, guys, the impurities come out, the bitterness you have, the doubts, the faithlessness, they all come out. And then what you're going to do is going to remove them. And then, you're, and then God's going to see himself inside of you and he's going to say, man, I'm alive in this golden disciple. I'm alive. You know, if you're faithful in the kingdom of God, I want to lift you up. I want to lift you up. I want to lift up our amazing sister, Keithra Adderley. Keithra Adderley. I want to lift up Keithra Adderley. Super sold out sister. One of the most smartest sisters I know. Incredibly smart. I'm like shocked at how smart she is. Cranking single professional, has an awesome home. I'm like, wow, faithful. Gone through a lot of trials. I mean, Reuben, faithful Dutch disciple. Faithful. Faithful Dutch disciple. Faithful. Reuben over there, guys. You know, if you've been baptized this year and you're still in the kingdom, I want to lift you up. I want to lift you up. Faithful. Faithful. We got remnants who are faithful. I mean, I've got the best remnants. I don't know about any other churches, but I've got the best remnants. My remnants crank. My remnants are awesome in the church. Faithful remnants. Faithful remnants. I also got to lift up one of my sons in the faith, Sylvan. You know, Sylvan, he, he, he's, he's, you know, he's battling his demons here and there, uh, like we all do. And, but, uh, but I like Sylvan. Sylvan messages me in the week. He's like, bro, bro. I'm like, okay, what's up, bro? It's like, I'm tired of hearing you preach. Your savings are not saving anyone. I was like, okay, okay, what's up, bro? It's like, bro, I've got so much savings and I'm not saving anyone. I want to give them to the church. And Sylvan is giving up his savings so so, so he can sacrifice financially to build up the kingdom of God. That's Sylvan. You know, family, I want to inspire you. God is refining your faith because he wants you to become a golden disciple. A golden disciple. Golden faith. Let's go to Judges 11, guys, okay? We're still in the book of Judges. First point is simply, God wants to use you, not abuse you. I'm fully convinced that if people could take God to court for the abuse they believe he put them through. I fully believe and persuade that people will do that. They'll take God to court. They'll bring up all the evidence of what God has done in their life to prove the abuse. He did this to me growing up. He allowed this to me growing up. He has all the power in the world and he just stood there watching while I got sexually abused. I want to report God as an abuser. 
And I believe people would do that if they had that opportunity to report God as an abuser. But I want to persuade you, family, that as we study out this guy, Jephthah, God doesn't want to abuse you. He actually wants to use you. He wants to use you. Okay? Now, why do I say that? Look at this guy, Judges 11. Okay? Judges 11, verse 1. It says, Jephthah, the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Whew. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you're a son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Verse 4, sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so you can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you count me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, nevertheless, we are turned to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites and you'll be head over us all who live in Gilead. You know, Jephthah, I like Jephthah. Because Jephthah, his name means God opens. God opens. And the Bible says, Jephthah was a mighty warrior. I'm like, wow. How did he become mighty, Frank? What made Jephthah mighty? Well, we see over here that his mother was a prostitute. And he was abandoned by his own family. And God, in a way, was opening the door for greatness for Jephthah. You know, I, I, uh, there's a story with this guy, this rich millionaire. And uh, this, this, this rich millionaire, of course, he, he throws his party. And he invites all the people who he believes are great and bold individuals with, with, with great examples, okay? He has his party. He invites everyone. Everyone comes to the party. So it's amazing. It's like, whoa, all these people. It's like, ooh, it's a great party. And, and, and then he, he makes an announcement. He takes the mic. He says, okay, guys, uh, I welcome you all here and so forth. Thank you for coming to this uh, amazing party. But, you know, at the back, I've got this pool. And in this pool is all the exotic animals you can think about. It's got the Brazilian alligator in there. It's got the Australian shark in there. I mean, it's got all kinds of animals. And I'm going to give a million euros to the individual that can swim across this pool to the other side and display an act of bravery. Now, people are like, man. People are like, no, this is challenging. No, I don't think anyone can do this. And he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. And nothing. So, okay. He leave, he leave, of course, he leaves it open. Then the party continues. Everyone's, like, everyone's having a good time. Everyone's having a good time, right? Um, and out of nowhere, they hear a splash. Everyone's like, oh my goodness, a splash. So everyone races to the backyard to see the pool, and there's this guy who is in there. And this guy's swimming. He's swimming. Everyone's like, oh my goodness, this guy's going to town. He's swimming. He's swimming. He's swimming. Everyone's cheering for him. Everyone's cheering for him. And he finally makes it to the other side, and he comes out like a Rambo movie. He's like, Phew, just comes out. Comes out of the pool. And now the owner's like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. I've never seen this before in my whole entire life. You're so brave. You're so bold. You're so mighty. I'm going to give you a million euros just r right now. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a car. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you my house. Matter of fact, ask whatever you want. And I'll give it to you. Now this guy's like catching his breath. <sighs> Just came out of the water. It's like, you can ask anything you want. <sighs> I just want the name of the guy who pushed me in. You see, sometimes you need a little push 
to be great. <laughs> Little push. And that's what God does to you. He opens the door of greatness, but we don't want to go through the door of fatherlessness. We don't want to go through the door of abandonment. We don't want to go through the door of family, knowing your family, becoming a disciple. And, and we think God is abusing us, but then he's actually opening the door to be great and mighty. You see that, family? And I don't think Jephthah would have thought at this time when all these things happened to him that he would become a judge and a leader for Israel. I don't think he thought that. I don't think he's like, okay, how do I become a leader? Okay, let me allow myself to be, no. <laughs> you see that, guys? So Jephthah didn't realize, he didn't see that, okay, God was doing something great over here, okay? Now, check this out. Now, he, he, he gets, you know, he gets abandoned, but he finds himself with, with, with a bunch of guys that you don't want to be around. He says, we're a gang of scoundrels. Gather around him. And they follow him. Now, you got to ask yourself the question, who are some of your friends in the kingdom? Who are your friends? Who are your friends in the kingdom? You see that? This guy was around bad company, man. Gang of scoundrels. I mean, you, you got to ask and question yourself, you know, do, does your friendship help you be more like Christ or less like Christ? You gotta ask yourself that, okay, does, does, do my friends in the kingdom of God help me be more like Christ or less like Jesus? You gotta ask yourself that question. You need friends that tell you the truth, guys. You need friends that tell you, bro, your breath stinks, here's a breath mint. Bro, you need, you need deodorant, here you go, bro. Bro, that haircut's terrible, don't try that again, bro. <laughs> terrible, don't do it again. Okay, it's bad haircut. Okay, bro, and so forth. You need, you need friends like that. I'm telling you, man, I, I need those friends. I need guys like that in my life to tell me the truth. And for the sisters, you know, you, you need friends to tell you, sis, that dress is too tight. Don't, don't wear it. Don't wear it. It's too tight. Now, let me help you out. You know, sadly, you know, we, we've come to a point in the church where some disciples don't, don't take discipling very well when it comes to purity of clothing for the sisters. They don't take it very well. Now, let me help you guys out, okay? Men are visual, okay? That's men, to help you guys understand how Jesus Christ and God made us. We're family, remember? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> men are visual. Now, as disciples, man, we got the Holy Spirit, we got the scriptures to, in a way, help us control that area. So that's, that's, that's the, the perks of being a disciple, okay? But men are visual. So if a sister tells you, sis, don't wear that. Trust me, to a brother, it's, gonna, it's like times 1,000. Times one, just to help you guys, sisters, okay? And so, you know, I, I used to, let me help you guys out. I, I used to, I, I, used to get, I used to get decided by Michael Williamson like crazy. So I used to, I was an Instagram model for a long time, <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, I, I used to, man, I, I used to, you know, post all kinds of photos on Instagram. Just, 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 just me, you know, just, just, you know, just, 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 man. And I, I used to go to town, I used to get, I used to hire like, you know, professional photos and stuff like that for a, a, a good camera. I used to use Photoshop, Lightroom and everything. I'm like, okay, the, the, the white's gotta be white, the black's gotta be black. I was invested, guys. I was invested. And then, you know, when those likes started coming in and those comments, man, I was like, oh. The validation, yes. It's amazing. And then my disciple was like, bro, what's going on here, bro? What in the prideful, self-absorbed nature is this? It's like you have, no, you have no photos with disciples. It's just you, you, you all the way. I mean, where are the brothers, bro? Where's your church? I was like, 
Amen. You know, that's what I was <laughs> And yeah, and, and, and I knew, I was like, nah, I gotta change that. You know, I, so what you guys see on Instagram is way less than what I had, okay? I removed a lot of stuff. <laughs> but I, I need my disciple to tell me the truth. Say, bro, what's wrong with you? Okay? You gotta have your family and friends. Can your social media, dis, uh, bab- can, can it baptize people? Can your social media baptize people? Can people come to your social media and say, wow, you believe in Jesus? Wow, I want to be like you in a Christ-like way. Can your social media baptize people? Now, he didn't have good friends. This guy didn't have good friends. Okay, he didn't have good friends. You know, the Bible says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. So you, you, you better be happy you've got friends and disciples that tell you the truth. You better be happy you've got counsel. You better be fired up. Better be fired up. You know, I, I got to lift up my sons, you know, Tariq and Jahir. They, they, they got that, that David and Jonathan kind of friendship in the church. They've got that kind of friendship. I mean, they, 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 they in studies together. They baptize baptizing together. They do so many things together. I'm like, okay, hey, man, that's awesome right there. That's a, it's an amazing friendship that they have. It's very godly. They serve together. They go on kingdom days together. It's like, wow. We see that that, that friendship helps them to be more like Christ. Yeah. See that? And you got to ask yourself, you know, is that the kind of friendship you have or is your friendship full of gossiping? Yeah. Gossip and slander. Is, is, that your, is that your friendships? You know, you're gossiping and slandering, you know, against disciples. You know the word slander in the Greek, it means diabolos. It means to do the work of the devil. So when you are a disciple slandering disciples in the church, Satan's like, bro, thank you so much for doing my work. Says, thank you so much. Man, my good and faithful servant, you are awesome. Satan's fired up. See that, guys? So we, 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 we got we to gotta make sure that we, we pick our friends wisely. But you know what I like, Jephthah? Even though he had a, a gang of scoundrels, he became their leader. He's like, I'm not going to get influenced by these guys. I'm going to lead them to Christ right there. I'm going to lead them to God. So that's what I like about Jephthah. Even though he had kind of bad friends, but he wasn't in a way, um, you know, clouded by the friends. He became their leader and they followed Jephthah. Now let's skip down to verse 28. Check this out. Verse 28. Verse 28, he gives a whole history of the movement and stuff like that in the first few verses. 28 says, The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message of Jephthah, sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites, from Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aru to the vicinity of Minith, as far as Abel Karim, thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter? Down to the sound of timbrels, she was his only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter! You have brought me down and I'm devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went to the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he had vowed, as she was a virgin. From this comes the Israel tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for, 40 de- for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. You know, you got to be careful what you, what you vow. Got to be careful what you vow. Now, commentaries say all kinds of stuff about this. They say, oh no, he didn't really sacrifice his daughter, you know, because God would never accept the kind of sacrifice. Now, you have to understand, when you study at the book of Judges, there's a lot of sin in Judges. I mean, the people are worshiping Baal, Ashtoreth, Chemosh, all kinds of gods, and so forth. So they, 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 they were mixing various gods with the one true God, Israel. 
Okay? So there is a very huge possibility that he, he did sacrifice her. A very huge possibility he offered her up, thinking he's offering it to God, but he's not offering it to God, he's offering it to a different God. Now, his mother was a Canaanite, okay? So that means she was from the land of Canaan. So Jephthah grew up with beliefs that were not really uh, Jewish or Israel kind of beliefs, okay? Uh, he, he grew up in the land of Tob. Now, Tob was also full of idolatry uh, and all this kind of stuff. So he, he yeah, he, I believe he, he sacrificed her. I believe that. Because it doesn't say that God stopped her and stuff like that, like he does with Abraham and his, and his, and his uh, son, Isaac. Yeah. So it happened. He sacrificed her. Now check this out. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It's after Proverbs. Check this out. Ecclesiastes 5. You know, God never asks you to make a vow, but when you do it, he wants you to fulfill it. Ecclesiastes 5. Verse 4 says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And don't protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. Man. You know what makes people not, not keep their vows? They don't fear God. They don't fear God. And that's why they don't, they don't keep their vows. They don't fear God. They think, ah, God is dead. And what can happen is that we become familiar with God. You know what happens when you're familiar with someone? You, you, you stop having awe and reverence when you're familiar with the person? And when I think about that, I'm like, wow, in life, we've made different vows in our lives. You know, think about your, your wedding vows. Okay, Mary's ministry. Okay, Mary's. You guys remember your, your wedding vows? You remember how it was like, right? The husband, I vow. I vow to tell you the most beautiful woman in the world every single day of my life. I vow to clean the house every day. I vow to be the most cranky husband in the world. Okay. Wow. Man. And then the wife, the wife is like, I vow to watch all your sports games every single time. I vow to be the most submissive woman in the world. And you make these vows. And then you get married. And then, you, and then you get used to each other. And you forget your vows. I've been there. I've been there, guys. Okay, Mary's ministry. Is that, is that, am I the only one who forgot their vows? Okay, there we go. So we've got a few, few honest marrieds and a few other marrieds that don't want to get in trouble. Okay. We've been there. We forget our vows. So, man, I forgot this is what I vowed to my wife. Wow, this is what I forgot to vow to my, my husband and so forth. And you know, as disciples, we make a vow that Jesus is Lord. We make a vow that Jesus is Lord in front of everybody. That means he's in control of everything in your life. That's what it means to make Jesus your Lord. You vow, Jesus, you're in control of my life, my schedule, everything. You pick everything for me. You determine where I live. You determine who I date and marry. You determine everything. That's the vow you make. Jesus is Lord, right? So when you break that vow, it means you don't fear God. That's what it means. You don't fear God. You make a financial vow, right? Yeah, we vow, hey, to give financially every week and so forth. And, and, and when we don't give financially, that means we don't fear God. That's what it means. We don't fear God. Okay? So this, this, this shows, guys, that we got we to gotta fulfill our vows. We gotta fulfill our vows. We make a vow as disciples. Okay, my mission is to seek and save the lost. I mean, man, we, we imagine this room filled up with people, guys, hearing the message. Just imagine that. Imagine next week, Zodekirk, I hear the good news. Oh my goodness. Under Haven and Attached's leadership, the church was at 200. I was like, oh my goodness. Imagine that, guys. 
Imagine a room of 200 people worshiping God. Just imagine that. You know, is that still your vow to seek and save the lost? You vowed that when you got baptized. You vowed to make that your mission, to save a disciple and save the lost. You know, I challenge you, renew your vows and fulfill them. Renew, if, if there's some vows, you're like, man, okay, I kind of tanked this here. Okay, just renew them. That's fine. And keep your vows. Amen, guys? Okay? Keep your vows. I don't have much time for this one over here. Let's go back to Judges uh, 12. In Judges 12, I'll quickly read this one in verse 1 to 7. It says, The Ephraimites' forces were called out, and they crossed over to Zephon. They say to Jephthah, Why did you go to fight the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn down your house over your head. Man, these guys were like, man, they were ticked off. They're not invited to the Bible study. <laughs> so I, I, I hope that's, that's our heart as well. You know, we get angry and no one invites us to a Bible study. You know, or do you rejoice that no one invited you to a Bible study? See that? So these guys were ticked off. No, bro, why, why didn't you call me for a Bible study? You see that? Well, you didn't call us to fight. Okay? It doesn't say Bible study. You, you guys know I'm making the Word of God alive and active today. Okay? You guys with me, right? Okay. Uh, verse 2. Jephthah answered, I and my people were engaged in a great struggle with the Ammonites, and although I called, you didn't save me out of their hands. When I saw that you wouldn't help, I took my life in my hands and crossed over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave me victory over them. Now why have you come up to today to fight me? Jephthah then called together the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. The Gileadites struck them down because the Ephraimites had said, You Gileadites are renegades from Ephraim and Manasseh. The Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan leading to, the, to Ephraim. And whenever a survivor of Ephraim said, Let me cross over, the men of Gilead asked him, Are you an Ephraimite? If he replied, No, they said, All right, say Shibboleth. If he said Sibboleth, because he cannot pronounce the word correctly, they seized him and killed him at the force of the Jordan. 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Jephthah led Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in a town in Gilead. The second point is God's not dead, so you better be prepared. I won't go too much into it over here, but these guys, they were, they were not prepared. <laughs> they were tested. They were confronted. Say this, say that. And when, when, when they couldn't pronounce the word correctly, because of course their accent and everything, they got killed. And I, I believe, man, if they had prepared, maybe they would have survived. You know, the Bible does say we've got to prepare ourselves to give a reason for the hope that we have. You see that? Yeah. We've got to prepare ourselves. Yeah. And a lack of preparation here caused 42,000 people to die. And it's, it's, it's got to be at a point, we as a family, we've got to learn to train ourselves to be godly. We've got to learn to train ourselves. Far be it that only five people know how to make someone to a disciple. Far be it. That cannot be the case over here. You see that? We, we got to have everybody able to teach someone from the beginning until the very end, all the way to come the cost and make them to a true baptized disciple. You know, I got to lift up, you know, Helene and uh, Rodania. They are just newly baptized and they're already leading Bible studies. I mean, wow. Already. Man, that's amazing. They're prepared. And they're ready. They're just going after it. They're going after it. So guys, we, we've got to be prepared. I believe what's going to help us in the, next, in the next coming weeks and months is when every single disciple says, okay, I'm going to fully equip myself to make someone else into a disciple. And we're going to see this room packed out. We're going to see Zadok packed out. And we're going to be able to reach our goal next year, guys. Amen. Now, why do you do that? Because you believe that God's not dead. That's why you'll do it. You believe that God is not dead. You know, in closing, I want to persuade you, we, we serve a living God. A living God. And he wants, he desires every man to be saved. You know, if you're here today, 
I, I want to encourage you that we serve a living God, and if anything is dead in your life, God can resurrect it again. He can resurrect that love that you have for him. He can resurrect that faith that you, you lost for him. He can renew it right there. So if, you, if, you, if you're here for the first time, please, I encourage you, get into a Bible study with this and learn what it truly means to be a Christian and a soul lot a disciple. Now for everyone else, your past has happened to make you mighty. Your past has happened to make you a mighty warrior. Understand that God is refining your faith so he can make your faith like gold. And lastly, we've got to be prepared by training ourselves to be godly because we serve a living God. I love you and to God be all the glory.